Welcome to Mainstream Current, y'all. I'm Drew Hoagland, and today I'm going to be fighting against the birds as to how my filming is going to go, rather the audio. I just started filming because they just stopped squawking, so hopefully they hold out. Today is a continuation of videos that we've looked at between um, offshore wind turbines, which led to Maine Won't Wait, which then the um, Avon Grid bio happened with the heat pump rebate at the same time. Now uh, the offshore wind auction is happening. Well, it's been scheduled for October 6th. So this is a continuation of those videos. As I've said in other ones, you can't really look at one without getting into the others. So this is just part of that series. From Maine Public, to start off by Nicole Orgioski. Feds set October date for Gulf of Maine offshore wind auction. The U.S. Interior Department announced it will host a lease sale for the eight areas in the Gulf of Maine that federal officials want to develop into commercial offshore wind farms. The auction will be held on October 29th. I'm sorry, I thought it was October 6th, I guess. Anyway, October 29th. Crows. Six of the potential wind plots are located off outer Cater, 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 Cape Cod. The remaining two sites are off the main coast. In total, the sites encompass about 850,000 acres, about 120,000 acres, few, fewer acres than initially proposed earlier this year. Federal officials said in a new release that the Potential lease areas have been reduced in size in order to avoid offshore fishing grounds and sensitive marine habitat. If leased and developed entirely, federal officials within the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management say these areas have the potential to generate about 13 gigawatts of wind energy, enough to power roughly 4.5 million homes. According to the final sale notice, a total of 14 en entities have been legally, technically, and financially qualified to bid during the upcoming auction. The eight areas are separated from a small parcel off the southern coast, which the state of Maine has leased as a site to test floating wind turbines. The growing enthusiasm for the clean energy future is infectious, said Interior Secretary Deb Holland in a statement. Today's announcement, which builds on the execution of the nation's first floating offshore wind energy research lease in Maine, lease in Maine last month, is a result of years of thoughtful coordination between our teams, the Gulf of Maine states, industry, and the tribes of the ocean users who share our interests in the health and longevity of our ocean. <coughs> it's getting dark. I'm going to have to not film this dark in the future. I love that Maine's a leader, and if something like clean energy and offshore wind turbines could be initiated here and it could be beneficial in all of its adoptions in its current technology across the world, I would be floored. But we're not there yet. We're not ready for this. Maine isn't ready for this. You can see the mosquitoes. And, and we're just setting ourselves up to be... It's not looking good. I'm trying to choose my words carefully, but we don't want to be in foreign entities controlled. And as we've discussed, Avangrid has gone 100% private. Abir Drola is now the 100% uh, shareholders. Our state was sold out for electricity for $2.8 billion. 2.5. Either way. Not a substantial amount of money. And... Now we're trying to generate more electricity, but wind turbines, like, is this the way to go? So I want to start off by recapping what we've talked about in the wind turbine so far, because it's been kind of floaty off and on, and then sometimes there'll be things interjected where uh, it normally wouldn't have, where you normally wouldn't expect to find it. Maine is actively exploring the potential of wind energy, particularly through offshore wind turbines. Recently, the state secured the nation's first floating offshore wind research lease, allowing the deployment of up to 12 turbines in the Gulf of Maine. 
This project, which could generate up to 144 megawatts of renewable energy, is seen as a crucial step in studying the viability of floating offshore wind technology. The research will provide valuable data to inform future commercial wind energy projects in the region. However, there are significant challenges and concerns surrounding these developments. A recent incident off Cape Cod where a wind turbine blade broke and debris washed up on Nantucket beaches has raised concerns about the environmental and mechanical risks associated with offshore wind farms. The incident has pr prompted Maine officials to closely monitor safety and environmental protocols as they move forward with their own wind energy plans. Additionally, the Maine Lobstering Union has successfully lobbied to exclude prime fishing areas from offshore wind development, reflecting the ongoing tension between renewable energy initiatives and traditional industries like fishing. Despite these concerns, the state remains committed to advancing wind energy with plans to release a request for proposal for significant offshore wind capacity by 2026. These developments illustrate both the promise and the complexities of integrating wind energy into Maine's energy landscape. Uh, that's by Power Technology Maritime Executive, ex Executive and Press Herald. So, I mean, as I've said, it is, it is significant that we got the first offshore floating wind turbine lease, but we're pushing this too quickly. We don't know enough about it off like, there is Horns, Horns Rev Farm, which is out of Denmark. I'm going to do a follow-up video on that, where we look into a wind farm that is off the coast and has been for years. So we can look into some actual data from that, and I'm going to do that in a follow-up video. But I wanted to just kind of understand wind turbines and, like, how they work, what the cost is, and how to... How to um, decompose of them uh, uh yeah how do we get rid of them so the cost to build um there's onshore and offshore we're going to focus on offshore because that's what we're talking about with the floating offshore offshore wind turbines are more expensive with costs compared to onshore with costs ranging from 3.5 million to 4.5 million per, per megawatt hour for for megawatts for a 10 megawatt turbine, this could mean a total cost of 35 million to 45 million dollars. Maintenance costs. Maintenance for offshore turbines is higher, again, than onshore, typically about 120,000 to 140,000 per megawatt annually, due to more challenging environmental conditions. This can total 2.4 million dollars. 2.8 million dollars per megawatt over 20 years the life expectancy repair costs repairing wind turbines especially offshore can be quite costly major repairs such as replacing a gearbox can cost upwards of 200,000 to 500,000 per incident blade replacements or major structural repairs could cost even more okay so that's how you set them up what's the savings like and the economic impact. Energy savings. The switch to wind power is expected to save money in the long term by reducing dependency on fossil fuels. Over a 25 year lifespan, a single 2 megawatt onshore wind turbine can generate approximately 6 million kilowatt hours per year, which translates to a savings of about 300,000 to 400,000 annually at current electricity rates. Two things there. Expected. They always say things like potentially or expected or the data indicates. And then here it's saying at current electricity rates. But you know, we've seen those go up and up. Environmental health and savings. The savings from reduced carbon emissions, air pollution and associated health costs are significant. A report by the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory estimated the wind power could save $7.3 billion annually in health-related costs in the U.S. by 2050. Give me a break. That number is pulled out of an asshole. There is so many, 2050, so we're going that far out. We're, we're, there's so much to take in consideration that $7.3 billion, like, that whole thing is all just if and buts. 
there is nothing substantial. There's no way that you and I can go back and kind of calculate what they're saying. There's so many variables involved in that. Come on. Comparison to fossil fuels. While the upfront costs of wind turbines are high, wind energy is becoming increasingly competitive with fossil fuels. The levelized cost of energy, LCOE, for wind is now comparable to or lower than that of coal and natural gas in many regions, ranging from $30 to $60 per megawatt hour for onshore wind versus $40 to $80 per megawatt hour for natural, new natural gas plants. For new natural gas plants. They're not talking about ones that are already established. And and they're talking about established offshore wind turbines, but then they're comparing them to new natural gas plants. No, compare them both to ongoing or compare them both to new. Can't do one and the other. In conclusion, while the initial investment in wind turbines is substantial, the long-term savings on energy costs combined with environmental and health benefits make wind energy a financially and ecologically sound choice for the future. Maritime Executive and Press Herald. <laughs> There's, like, the more I research into it, the more I'm just... We're pushing too fast. We're pushing too fast. Wind turbines are generally effective in converting wind energy into electricity, with modern turbines having an efficiency rate of 35 to 50%. This means they convert about 35 to 50% of the wind's kinetic energy into electrical energy. But also if they spin too fast, they have to be slowed down, turned off, uh, and they, like, they can't keep up. It's not like the more the wind blows, the better they do. No, they reach a point when they can't handle any more, and even what they can handle is only 30 to 50%. Capacity factor. The capacity factor, which measures how much electricity a turbine produces compared to its maximum potential, typically ranges from 30 to 40 percent onshore turbines and 40 to 50 percent for offshore turbines. This is due to more consistent and stronger winds offshore. Energy production. A single large onshore wind turbine can produce around 6 million kilowatt hours per year, enough to power about 1,500 American homes. Offshore turbines, being larger, can produce signi significantly more. Okay, what about maintenance and repair? Those are things that absolutely have to be factored in. So onshore turbines tend to require more frequent repairs due to their exposure to various environmental conditions, though exact frequencies can vary depending on the turbine's location and design. Offshore turbines, despite their higher build quality, also face frequent repairs due to the harsh marine conditions. Common issues include gearbox, generators, and blades. Gearbox failures are particularly common with an average failure rate of 1 in 145 turbines per year. This can lead to significant downtime and costs. Lifetime and repairs. Wind turbines typically have a lifespan of 20 to 25 years. Over this, turbine, over this period, a turbine may undergo significant repairs particularly in later years. Minor repairs are frequent and can occur annually, such as replacing electronic components or sensors. Major repairs, such as gearbox or blade replacement, are less common but significantly more expensive. A typical onshore turbine might require a major repair every 5 to 10 years. Downtime. On average, wind turbines have a downtime of about 3 to 5% for their operational time annually due to maintenance and repair meaning they are non-operational for 10 to 20 days each year. <laughs> Overall reliability. Despite these challenges, wind turbines are considered highly reliable. Modern designs and advances in technology have significantly improved their durability and efficiency. The use of remote monitoring and predictive maintenance has also reduced the frequency and impact of repairs, allowing operators to address issues before they result in significant downtime. In summary, while wind turbines do require regular maintenance and can experience technical issues, they remain an effective and reliable source of renewable energy, particularly when supported by advancements in monitoring and repair technologies. At least according to the Maritime Executive and Press Herald, and... Did my mic stop again? <laughs> I 
Ready? Fight!